misunderstood product lines that actually bothered me for a while that you can't find any good information on about and there's a lot of conflict sometimes even when you uh, call Garmin on their magnetometers. And so I'm not sponsored by Garmin at all, but this is a video that really would have helped me if I could have found that information and just about everything you find on the internet is, is just a little bit off. So the Garmin magnetometers, the GMU 11, the 22 that we're going to be talking about, and then we're going to talk about the GMU 44, which almost nobody knows what that is. They're a pretty rare bird. And why you would pick one over the other. It is one of the most misunderstood things, I think, on um, the internet that you'll see a lot of discussions on on forums. I always wanted to hop on one of those forums and you know throw this one out there and be like, hey, uh, can you tell me when I would need to use a, a GMU 44? What, what, what is that? Does it even exist? What's the point of that? So that's, that's gonna be what this video is. The GMU 11 is the most common. It seems to be the cheapest, but it boils down to this. The internet commandos will tell you to pick a Garmin magnetometer based on the performance of your aircraft. That is what it says in most Garmin installation or user manuals. Um, however, uh, it is the least significant reason and has the least to do with why you would pick one of these. Those are kind of like minimums. So I always tell people this, I've discovered Garmin manuals are written from uh, the, the best way to approach them is this is the least you can do to get the minimum advertised performance. They hope you go above and beyond. So when they say something can't do something, they're say, that doesn't mean that's the reason you go to this one. So for instance, this one, you know, it's 200 knots or greater. That's typically, um, that's why you peop, hear people see, hey, don't get the GMU 11. If, if you're flying that airplane, you don't need the GMU 22 because you're, airspeed is slow enough and that's why Garmin made that GMU 22. That's not the case. It just so happens the user's manual say, hey, 200 knots or greater, you have to have a GMU 22 or a GMU 44. Uh, but the GMU 20, 20, the GMU 11 is for um, lower performance aircraft. Well, th that's the last time I'll talk about performance. That's not why Garmin has three different magnetometers. Uh, that's not the point of this. That wasn't Garmin's point either. That's just the flavor that's come out on the internet. It is. It just happens to be one of the minimums um, for a GMU 11. You gotta, you gotta be under 200 knots. Past that, that's the last time I'm gonna mention it. The real difference between these is how they communicate. These are the two that you'll hear most people talking about, the GMU 22 and the GMU 11. Like I said, most people don't know what a GMU 44 is and um, they're very hard to find and you'll you'll see almost nothing about them so um, the gmu 11 is designed simply put the difference between it and the others it's not to be cheaper turns out this is a highly sensitive magnetometer it is every bit as sensitive as these other two there are some differences besides the fact that it's way cheaper this is designed to communicate on a controller area network a CAN bus. So these don't. That's the biggest difference. So a lot of times you'll see guys like, well, you know, for this reason, that reason, this, you know, I'm, I'm going to go with the GMU-22 because it's built for those higher performance aircraft and I really want reliability. You could literally be cutting yourself off at the knees and not even paying attention if you don't understand why these things are and what they are. The GMU-11 is designed to work on a CAN bus. The advantage it has over these other two is not only your Atahars units, but anything that has to do with a magnetometer or whatever want to talk to it, even your G3X, which doesn't directly communicate with it, although it does for configuration, can see it. So since it's on the network, so to speak, it's on your CAN bus, anything that might need to communicate with this thing, everybody can see everybody, everybody could talk to everybody in theory, providing the software allows it. They'll ignore messages that aren't meant for them, they'll pick up the ones that are. It's just like an old party line, on the, like on the Andy Griffith show. So. That is a big advantage in the sense that if you had two of these, which is a great idea, if you had two GMU 11s, any Atahars unit and any G3X or any other thing in the system that might have any communication with a magnetometer um, can see it. One, 
one magnetometer can service two Atahars units. If Atahars one goes down, Atahars two, I mean, your plane doesn't even blink. Atahars two has full communication and access to a magnetometer. Likewise, if you have two, that is not the case on the 22s and 44s. These go Atahars to Atahars, unit to unit. These are serial. So you'll hear people say, these are not quite as sensitive. That is not true. They are highly sensitive. It is, in fact, they are susceptible to interference. And so there are some minimum standards, um, mounting requirements that Garmin lists like in their manual. A lot of people tend to freak out over these. Notice at the top, people don't read the notes. And a lot of times I've noticed too in Garmin manuals, a lot of people don't read the titles. It says recommended. Odds are you're never gonna be able to meet those requirements in most aircraft, especially if it's in an OC, OTC product. And that's also where these come in. This was very neat because this is a plug and play deal. Garmin was able to offer these on a lot of OTCs like with the G5 and you know get STCs on retrofitting older aircraft. And they just pop one of these in. You can just ignore everything else in the aircraft, go out into the wing, throw in these things weigh nothing, throw in a GMU 11 and you've got you know IFR capability, good to go. And uh, the GMU-22 is serial. Serial is much more robust for communication interference. So the GMU-22, the difference between the GMU-22 and the GMU-11, it's not the airspeed thing. That's an, that's an obvious, that's a minimum. That's not the difference between them. The difference between them is the GMU-11 communicates on CAM network. GMU-22 communicates on serial. The GMU-11 is susceptible to interference. The GMU-22 is much, much less susceptible to interference. It's twofold. Not only because of its housing, it can handle more magnetic interference in its location in the aircraft than can a GMU-11, but its communication is much more robust for uh, communication interference, it's serial. So, I mean, you know, still got to do good shielding and all that stuff, but it communicates, you know, RS-485, RS-232. Um, and that is going to allow you to run it in wire bundles. This, Garmin says, do not run it in wire bundles. There's, you know, use your experience on this, uh, but Garmin says do not run your CAN bus through wire bundles. That's a really good idea if you don't want any communication interference or any network error rate. This is not susceptible to that. So really, you would pick one of these actually more based on where you're gonna mount it, how your plane's built, do you have high currents you know, running through that could mess with you know, your CAN bus. So this is a little bit susceptible because it kind of opens up your CAN bus. You're gonna be running this thing either all the way back into the fuselage or most likely all the way out into a wing and you could have pulsating strobe lights that do all kinds of weird stuff. That is where suddenly you might want to choose a 22. Now, if it's a GA aircraft, this decision is going to have been made for you. That was really the point of these. It gets um, modern, high-tech, you know, redundant avionics for IFR into old aircraft that just about never had a hope of flying IFR again as far as the avionics go, even if, you know, people wanted to risk it with their engine and stuff. So the GMU-11 is really one of the best magnetometers that Garmin offers. Ironically, it's also the cheapest, but it is more sensitive to interference. That is the way to think of it. It is not a less sensitive magnetometer. The other thing that uh, I'll clear up real quick before I get to the 44 is that, um, you know, a lot of times if you've ever had maybe some professional training or something with Garmin, you'll come across the 72nd parallel, north of the 72nd parallel and various parts of the Southern hemisphere below uh, it's reciprocal. The performance of the Garmin GMU 11 and 22 is listed as unknown. Now I've got probably 75 hours north of the 72nd parallel behind a GMU 11 and uh, multiple IFR approaches and stuff like that. Um, of course we had backups and all that stuff, but that's not conclusive. Let me tell you what that's all about. The fact is the competitional lines of the earth, they get really dynamic up north of the 72nd parallel across Alaska, your declination will change so fast. If you're not on your toes with a traditional compass, you're kind of screwed anyways. So VOR navigation is uh, still a pretty big deal up there uh, for that reason. Digital compasses like this are extremely accurate. You know, their calibrations hold truer. They don't drift as bad, all kinds of stuff. So it is still much better if you're flying in the far north, in my opinion, to be, you know, running one of these. 
But uh, the 70 second parallel, there's a lot of misunderstanding, miscommunication. A lot of times you'll see it listed in, if you've had any, any training, they'll be like, um, yeah, the GMU 11, GMU 22, performance north of the 70 second parallel, that, that's gonna be an unknown. They make no comment on the 44. Um, it just depends on which Garmin engineer you get. At one point, one of the guys said, yes, 44 handles it fine. You know, it's what all the big boys are flying up there every day on all their IFR approaches. But then you'll hear guys say, no, no, actually all our magnetometers north of the 72nd parallel and in various aspects of the Southern Hemisphere. They say performance is unknown. People will repeat that as they don't work. Uh, Garmin says you're not supposed to be flying them north of those, which is freaking ridiculous. That is not it performance is unknown. They know exactly what the performance is, what the maximum deviation will be, the farthest you could ever possibly be off on this magnetometer if you stay within these design parameters. That's all known south of the 72nd parallel. If you're going to be operating a whole lot uh, above that, some guys from Garmin will say use a GMU 44. Uh, there's another you know, thing you'll see floating around. The GMU 44 is uh, not compatible with the G3X system. The G3X system is actually compatible with everything if you know how to wire it. The G3X is actually used to use the GMU 44 and they still can. Um, the software still allows it. Just a lot of guys, it's so rare. A lot of guys haven't seen one. Maybe some of the Garmin engineers aren't really familiar with that, but the GMU 44 works very well with the Garmin G3X system. The Blue Northern is going to get refit. Um, it's GMU 11s getting replaced with a GMU 44. So picking your GMU 22 or your uh, GMU 11, which is mostly what's going to come down to, if I had to stick it in kind of an odd place of the aircraft and there was going to be a lot of magnetic um, hardware and stuff going on, and I would pick the GMU 22 over that. The downside being, that you're gonna to go to one Atahars unit, which means you're probably gonna almost likely, you know, gonna to need to be running two of these. If you were in IFR, if you were gonna use a plane for IFR or your customer, you know, was a GMU 11 is possibly going to be a better choice, especially if there's multiple Atahars units involved. I mean, if they got two G5s, there you go. That's, that's at least two Atahars units right there. That's exactly the GMU 11's cup of tea. Serial communication in the GMU 22 to equal that level of redundancy, just in those two G5s, you're gonna to have to have two of these things. You're gonna to have to have, um, or if you have two, you know, GSU 25s, that's gonna be two of these awful also. Um, whereas if you only had one GMU 11, it can fully service both of those at a harsh units. So that is really, I never found that on the internet. Nobody ever talks about it. And that is really what boils down to. So this one, now you can see why yeah, it, it, it is the most common and it actually makes the most sense unless you're worried about running part uh, a big leg of your CAN bus out there um, and you don't want to do that, then go serial and get the GMU-22. You know, the G3X system is really built around the CAN bus and that's really what you should divide these by. It's just CAN and serial and that should be it. So, if, you know, if you're going this, you, then you probably need like a a 307 autopilot control panel so the 500 you know this is for aircraft that aren't going to use a lot of can this is for aircraft that are going to use a lot of can and and that's really the best most successful way to look at it and then if these design parameters are going to prevent you from using the gmu 11 you're going to have to go serial and most likely more than one the gmu 44 just touch on it real quick besides being about uh five to six times the price of any of these it is you know, it's robust in that it uses serial communication, but it is far and away the most robust in handling magnetic interference and mounting locations in the aircraft. So that could give you a net result of being a more sensitive, even though it is not, magnetometer in a sense that it can, you know, when the lines, computational lines, especially maybe up far north, begin to get a little fuzzy, it can perhaps detect those much better because any interference that it does have, um, it can shield against or ignore. The GMU 11, if basically if you just do a really, really, really good job putting it in and reducing or completely eliminating magnetic interference, um, you can conduct an interference test through the G3X and if you do a halfway decent job, and you're, you'd have to be a blithering idiot to get up around the 20% uh, that, that is allowed. So um, that's gonna be in, you know, you're gonna have a lot of interference if you get up to 20% and you're totally good 
you know, so they're, they're, they're a little bit more robust than uh, maybe the paperwork lets on, but they are much more sensitive to communication interference and magnetic interference. So this will help you deal with, the, deal with those. Um, the GMU 44 is obviously high performance. You could probably fly this thing as fast as you want to. This is gonna be what's in your great big jet liners and stuff like that and also just any high dollar aircraft in general, that's where you'll come across a GMU-44. So you really don't see them much, um, but they, they can be used in a G3X system. Uh, so the Blue Northern, which that has, it is going to be getting one. And, uh, and we'll test that and see how that goes. So that's, that's the breakdown on the Garmin magnetometers from my perspective.